Chapter Twenty Five of Miss Billy Married. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Miss Billy Married by Eleanor H. Porter. Chapter Twenty Five. Should old acquaintance be forgot? Bertram did not ask Billy very soon again to go to the theater. For some days, indeed, he did not ask her to do anything. Then one evening he did beg for some music. "'Billy, you haven't played to me or sung to me since I could remember,' he complained. "'I want some music.' Billy gave a merry laugh and wriggled her fingers experimentally. "'Mercy, Bertram, I don't believe I could play a note. You know I'm all out of practice.' "'But why don't you practice?' "'Why, Bertram, I can't. In the first place I don't seem to have any time except when Baby's asleep.' And I can't play then, I'd wake him up. Bertram sighed irritably, rose to his feet, and began to walk up and down the room. He came to a pause at last, his eyes bent a trifle disapprovingly on his wife. Billy dear, don't you wear anything but those wrapper things nowadays? he asked plaintively. Again Billy laughed, but this time a troubled frown followed the laugh. I know, Bertram, I suppose they do look dowdy sometimes, she confessed. You see, I hate to wear a really good dress. Baby rumples them up so, and I'm usually in a hurry to get him mornings, and these are so easy to slip into, and so much more comfortable for me to handle him in. Yes, of course, of course I see, mumbled Bertram, listlessly taking up his walk again. Billy, after a moment's silence, began to talk animatedly. Baby had done a wonderfully cunning thing that morning, and Billy had not had a chance yet to tell Bertram. Baby was growing more and more cunning anyway these days, and there were several things she believed she had not told him, so she told them now. Bertram listened politely, interestedly. He told himself that he was interested, too. Of course he was interested in the doings of his own child. But he still walked up and down the room a little restlessly coming to a halt at last by the window, across which the shade had not been drawn. Billy, he cried suddenly, with his old boyish earnestness, there's a glorious moon. Come on, let's take a little walk, a real fellow and his best girl walk, will you? Mercy, dear, I couldn't, cried Billy, springing to her feet. I'd love to, though, if I could, she added hastily, as she saw disappointment cloud her husband's face. But I told Delia she might go out. It isn't her regular evening, of course, but I told her I didn't mind staying with Baby a bit, so I'll have to go right up now. Uh, she'll be going soon. But, dear, you go and take your walk. It'll do you good. Then you can come back and tell me all about it. Only you must come in quietly so as not to wake the baby, she finished, giving her husband an affectionate kiss as she left the room. After a disconsolate five minutes of solitude, Bertram got his hat and coat and went out for his walk, but he told himself he did not expect to enjoy it. Bertram Henshaw knew that the old rebellious jealousy of the summer had him fast in its grip. He was heartily ashamed of himself, but he could not help it. He wanted Billy, and he wanted her then. He wanted to talk to her. He wanted to tell her about a new portrait commission he had just obtained, and he wanted to ask her what she thought of the idea of a brand new face of a girl for the Bohemian Ten exhibition next March. He wanted, but then what would be the use? She would listen, of course, but he would know by the very looks of her face that she would not be really thinking of what he was saying and he would be willing to wager his best canvas that in the very first pause she would tell about the baby's newest tooth or latest toy. Not but that he liked to hear about the little fellow, of course, and not but that he was proud as punch of him, too, but that he would like sometimes to hear Billy talk of something else, the sweetest melody in the world, if dinned into one's ears day and night, became something to be fled from. And Billy ought to talk of something else, too. Bertram, Jr., wonderful as he was, really was not the only thing in the world, or even the only baby. And other people, outsiders, their friends, had a right to expect that sometimes other matters might be considered their own, for instance. But Billy seemed to have forgotten this. 
no matter whether the subject of conversation had to do with the latest novel or a trip to Europe, under Billy's guidance it invariably led straight to Baby's Jack and Jill book, or to a perambulator journey in the public garden. If it had not been so serious it would have been really funny the way all roads led straight to one goal. He himself, when alone with Billy, had started the most unusual and foreign subjects, sometimes just to see if there were not somewhere a little bypath that did not bring up in his own nursery. He never, however, found one. But it was not funny. It was serious. Was this glorious gift of parenthood, to which he had looked forward as the crowning joy of his existence, to be nothing but a tragedy that would finally wreck his domestic happiness? It could not be. It must not be. He must be patient and wait. Billy loved him. He was sure she did. By and by, this obsession of motherhood, which had her so fast in its grip, would relax. She would remember that her husband had rights as well as her child. Once again, she would give him the companionship, love, and sympathetic interest so dear to him. Meanwhile, there was his work. He must bury himself in that. And fortunate indeed he was, he told himself, that he had something so absorbing. It was at this point in his meditations that Bertram rounded a corner and came face to face with a man who stopped him short with a jovial, Isn't it? By George, it is Bertie Henshaw. Well, what do you think of that for luck? And me only two days home from gay Paris. Oh, Seaver, how are you? You are a stranger. Bertram's voice and handshake were a bit more cordial than they would have been had he not at the moment been feeling so abused and forlorn. In the old days he had liked this Bob Seaver well. Seaver was an artist like himself, and was good company always. But Seaver and his crowd were a little too bohemian for William's taste, and after Billy came she too had objected to what she called that horrid Seaver man. In his heart Bertram knew that there was good foundation for their objections, so he had avoided Seaver for a time, and for some years now the man had been abroad, somewhat to Bertram's relief. Tonight, however, Seaver's genial smile and hearty friendliness were like a sudden burst of sunshine on a rainy day, and Bertram detested rainy days. He was feeling now, too, as if he had just met a whole week of them. "'Yes, I am something of a stranger here, not as Seaver, but I tell you what, little old Boston looks mighty good to me all the same. Come on, you're just the fellow we want. I'm on my way now to the old stamping ground. Come right about face, old chap, and come with me.' Bertram shook his head. "'Sorry, but I guess I can't tonight,' he sighed. Both gesture and words were unhesitating but the voice carried the discontent of a small boy who, while the sun is still shining, has been told to come into the house. Oh, rats, yes you can too, come on. Lots of the old crowd will be there. Griggs, B.B., Jack Jenkins, and Tully. We need you to complete the show. Jack Jenkins, is he here? A new eagerness had come into Bertram's voice. Sure, he came on from New York last night. Great boy, Jenkins. Just back from Paris, fairly covered with medals, you know. Yes, so I hear. I haven't seen him for four years. Better come tonight, then. No, began Bertram, with obvious reluctance. It's already nine o'clock, and— Nine o'clock, cut in Seaver with the broad grin. Since when has your limit been nine o'clock? I've seen the time when you didn't mind nine o'clock in the morning, Bertie. What's got— Oh, I remember. I met another friend of yours in Berlin, chap named Arkwright. And say, he's some singer, you bet. You're going to hear of him one of these days. Well, he told me all about how you'd settle down now. Sun and air, fireside bliss, pretty wife, and all the fixins. But I say, Bertie, doesn't she let you out any? Nonsense, Seaver, flared Bertram in annoyed wrath. Well, then, why don't you come tonight? If you want to see Jenkins, you'll have to. He's going back to New York tomorrow. For only a brief minute longer did Bertram hesitate. Then he turned squarely about with an air of finality. Is he? Well, then, perhaps I will, he said. I'd hate to miss Jenkins entirely. Good, exclaimed his companion, as they fell into step. 
Have a cigar? Thanks, don't mind if I do. If Bertram's chin was a little higher and his step a little more decided than usual, it was all merely by way of accompaniment to his thoughts. Certainly it was right that he should go, and it was sensible. Indeed, it was really almost imperative, due to Billy, as it were, after that disagreeable taunt of Seaver's, as if she did not want him to go when and where he pleased, as if she would consent for a moment to figure in the eyes of his friends as a tyrannical wife who objected to her husband's passing a social evening with his friends. To be sure, in this particular case, she might not favor Seaver's presence, but even she would not mind this once. And, anyhow, it was Jenkins that was the attraction, not Seaver. Besides, he himself was no undeveloped boy now. He was a man, presumably able to care for himself. Besides, again, had not Billy herself told him to go out and enjoy the evening without her, as she had to stay with the baby? He would telephone her, of course, that he had met some old friends and that he might be late. Then she would not worry. And forthwith, having settled the matter in his mind, and to his complete satisfaction, Bertram gave his undivided attention to Seaver, who had already plunged into an account of a recent art exhibition he had attended in Paris. End of chapter 25「Twenty Six of Miss Billy Married. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Miss Billy Married by Eleanor H. Porter. Chapter Twenty Six. Ghosts That Walked for Bertram. October proved to be unusually mild, and about the middle of the month, Bertram, after much unselfish urging on the part of Billy, went to a friend's camp in the Adirondacks for a week's stay. He came back with an angry, lugubrious face and a broken arm. Oh, Bertram, and your right one too, the same one you broke before, mourned Billy tearfully. Of course, retorted Bertram, trying in vain to give an air of jauntiness to his reply. Didn't want to be too changeable, you know. But how did you do it, dear? Fell into a silly little hole covered with underbrush. But Oh, Billy, what's the use? I did it, and I can't undo it. More's the pity. Of course you can't, you poor boy, sympathized Billy, and you shan't be tormented with questions. We'll just be thankful t'was no worse. You can't paint for a while, of course, but we won't mind that. It'll just give Baby and me a chance to have you all to ourselves for a time, and we'll love that. Yes, of course, sighed Bertram, so abstractedly that Billy bridled with pretty resentment. Well, I like your enthusiasm, sir, she frowned. I'm afraid you don't appreciate the blessings you do have, young man. Do you realize what I said? I remarked that you could be with Baby and me, she emphasized. Bertram laughed and gave his wife an affectionate kiss. Indeed, I do appreciate my blessings, dear, when those blessings are such treasures as you and Baby, but only his doleful eyes fixed on his injured arm finished his sentence. I know, dear, of course, and I understand, murmured Billy, all tenderness at once. They were not easy for Bertram, those following days. Once again he was obliged to accept the little intimate personal services that he so disliked. Once again he could do nothing but read or wander disconsolately into his studio and gaze at his half-finished face of a girl. Occasionally, it is true, Driven nearly to desperation by the haunting vision in his mind's eye, he picked up a brush and attempted to make his left hand serve his will, but a bare half-dozen irritating, ineffectual strokes were usually enough to make him throw down his brush in disgust. He never could do anything with his left hand, he told himself dejectedly. Many of his hours, of course, he spent with Billy and his son. And they were happy hours, too, but they always came to be restless ones before the day was half over. Billy was always devotion itself to him when she was not attending to the baby. He had no fault to find with Billy, and the baby was delightful. He could find no fault with the baby. But the baby was fretful. He was teething, Billy said. And he needed a great deal of attention, so naturally Bertram drifted out of the nursery after a time and went down into his studio, where were his dear empty palette, 
his orderly brushes, and his tantalizing face of a girl. From the studio, generally, Bertram went out onto the street. Sometimes he dropped into a fellow artist's studio, sometimes he strolled into a club or café where he knew he would be likely to find some friends who would help him while away a tiresome hour. Bertram's friends quite vied with each other in rendering this sort of aid, so much so indeed that, naturally perhaps, Bertram came to call on their services more and more frequently. Particularly was this the case when, after the splints were removed, Bertram found, as the days passed, that his arm was not improving as it should improve. This not only disappointed and annoyed him, but worried him. He remembered sultry disquieting warnings given by the physician at the time of the former break, warnings concerning the probable seriousness of a repetition of the injury. To Billy, of course, Bertram said nothing of all this, but just before Christmas he went to see a noted specialist. An hour later, almost in front of the learned surgeon's door, Bertram met Bob Seaver. Great Scott, Bertie, what's up? ejaculated Seaver. You look as if you'd seen a ghost. I have, answered Bertram, with grim bitterness. I've seen the ghost of, of every face of a girl I ever painted. Gory, so bad as that? No wonder you look as if you'd been disporting in graveyards, chuckled Seaver, laughing at his own joke. What's the matter? Arm on a rampage today? He paused for reply, but as Bertram did not answer at once, he resumed with gay insistence, Come on, you need cheering up. Suppose we go down to Trentini's and see who's there. All right, agreed Bertram dully. Suit yourself. Bertram was not thinking of Seaver, Trentini's, or whom he might find there. Bertram was thinking of certain words he had heard less than half an hour ago. He was wondering, too, if ever again he could think of anything but those words. The truth, the great surgeon had said, well, the truth is, I'm sorry to tell you the truth, Mr. Henshaw, but if you will have it, you've painted the last picture you'll ever paint with your right hand, I fear. It's a bad case. This break, coming as it did on top of the serious injury of two or three years ago, was bad enough but to make matters worse, the bone was imperfectly set and wrongly treated, which could not be helped, of course, as you were miles away from skilled surgeons at the time of the injury. We'll do the best we can, of course, but, well, you asked for the truth, you remember, so I had to give it to you. End of chapter 26 Recording by Phil Chenever, Baton Rouge, Louisiana Chapter Twenty Seven of Miss Billy Married. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenever. Miss Billy Married by Eleanor H. Porter. Chapter Twenty Seven: The Mother, the Wife. Bertram made up his mind at once that, for the present at least, he would tell no one what the surgeon had said to him. He had placed himself under the man's care, and there was nothing to do but to take the prescribed treatment and await results as patiently as he could. Meanwhile there was no need to worry Billy, or William, or anybody else with the matter. Billy was so busy with her holiday plans that she was only vaguely aware of what seemed to be an increase of restlessness on the part of her husband during those days just before Christmas. "'Poor dear, is the arm feeling hard today?' she asked one morning, when the gloom on her husband's face was deeper than usual. Bertram frowned, and did not answer directly. "'Lots of good I am these days!' he exclaimed, his moody eyes on the arm full of many-shaped, many-sized packages she carried. "'What are those for, the tree?' "'Yes, it's going to be so pretty, Bertram,' exulted Billy. "'And do you know?' Baby positively acts as if he suspected things, little as he is, she went on eagerly. He's as nervous as a witch. I can't keep him still a minute. How about his mother? hinted Bertram with a faint smile. Billy laughed. Well, I'm afraid she isn't exactly calm herself, she confessed, as she hurried out the room with her parcels. Bertram looked after her longingly, despondently. "'I wonder what she'd say if she knew,' he muttered. "'But she shan't know, till she just has to,' he vowed suddenly under his breath, striding into the hall for his hat and coat. 
Never had the Strata known such a Christmas as this was planned to be. Cyril, Marie, and the twins were to be there, also Kate, her husband, and three children, Paul, Egbert, and little Kate from the West. On Christmas Day there was to be a big family dinner with Aunt Hannah down from the annex. Then, in concession to the extreme youth of the young host and his twin cousins, there was to be an afternoon tree. The shades were to be drawn and the candles lighted, however, so that there might be no loss of effect. In the evening the tree was to be once more loaded with fascinating packages and candy bags, and this time the Gregories, Tommy Dunn, and all the rest from the annex were to have the fun all over again. From garret to basement the strata was aflame with holly and a glitter with tinsel. Nowhere did there seem to be a spot that did not have its bit of tissue paper or its trail of red ribbon, and everything, holly, ribbon, tissue, and tinsel, led to the mysteriously closed doors of the great front drawing-room, past which none but Billy and her accredited messengers might venture. No wonder, indeed, that even Baby scented excitement, and that Baby's mother was not exactly calm. No wonder, too, that Bertram, with his helpless right arm and his heavy heart, felt peculiarly forlorn and out of it. No wonder also that he took himself literally out of it with growing frequency. Mr. and Mrs. Hartwell and little Kate were to stay at the Strata. The boys, Paul and Egbert, were to go to Cyril's. Promptly at the appointed time, two days before Christmas, they arrived, and from that hour until two days after Christmas, when the last bit of holly, ribbon, tissue, and tinsel disappeared from the floor, Billy moved in a whirl of anxious responsibility that was yet filled with fun, frolic, and laughter. It was a great success, the whole affair. Everybody seemed pleased and happy, that is, everybody but Bertram, and he very plainly tried to seem pleased and happy. Even Cyril unbent to the extent of not appearing to mind the noise one bit, and Sister Kate, Bertram said, found only the extraordinary small number of four details to change in the arrangements. Baby obligingly let his teeth getting go, for the occasion, and he and the twins, Franz and Felix, were the admiration and delight of all. Little Kate, to be sure, was a trifle disconcerting once or twice, but everybody was too absorbed to pay much attention to her. Billy did, however, remember her opening remarks. "'Well, little Kate, do you remember me?' Billy had greeted her pleasantly. "'Oh, yes,' little Kate had answered with a winning smile. "'You're my Aunt Billy, what married my Uncle Bertram instead of Uncle William, as you said you would first. Everybody laughed, and Billy colored, of course. But little Kate went on eagerly. "'And I've been wanting just awfully to see you,' she announced. "'Have you? I'm glad, I'm sure. I feel highly flattered,' smiled Billy. "'Well, I have.' You see, I wanted to ask you something. Have you ever wished that you had married Uncle William instead of Uncle Bertram, or that you'd tried for Uncle Cyril before Auntie Marie got him? Kate, gasped her horrified mother, I told you. You see, she broke off, turning to Billy despairingly, she's been pestering me with questions like that ever since she knew she was coming. She never has forgotten the way you changed from one uncle to the other. You may remember it made a great impression on her at the time. Yes, I I remember, stammered Billy, trying to laugh off her embarrassment. But you haven't told me yet whether you did wish you'd married Uncle William or Uncle Cyril, interposed little Kate persistently. No, no, of course not, exclaimed Billy with a vivid blush, casting her eyes about for a door of escape and rejoicing greatly when she spied Delia with the baby, coming toward them. "'There, look, my dear, here's your new cousin, little Bertram,' she exclaimed. "'Don't you want to see him?' Little Kate turned dutifully. "'Yes'm, Aunt Billy, but I'd rather see the twins. Mother says they're real pretty and cunning.' "'Uh, yes, they are,' murmured Billy, on whom the emphasis of the there had not been lost. Naturally, as may be supposed, therefore, Billy had not forgotten little Kate's opening remarks. Immediately after Christmas, Mr. Hartwell and the boys went back to their western home, leaving Mrs. Hartwell and her daughter to make a round of visits to friends in the east. For almost a week after Christmas they remained at the Strata, 
and it was on the last day of their stay that little Kate asked the question that proved so momentous in results. Billy, almost unconsciously, had avoided tete-a-tetes with her small guest, but today they were alone together. Aunt Billy, began the little girl, after a meditative gaze into the other's face, you are married to Uncle Bertram, aren't you? I certainly am, my dear, smiled Billy, trying to speak unconcernedly. Well, then, what makes you forget it? What makes me forget? Why, child, what a question! What do you mean? I don't forget it, exclaimed Billy indignantly. Then what did Mother mean? I heard her tell Uncle William myself, she didn't know I heard, though, that she did wish you'd remember you were Uncle Bertram's wife as well as Cousin Bertram's mother. Billy flushed scarlet, then grew very white. At that moment, Mrs. Hartwell came into the room. Little Kate turned triumphantly. There, she hasn't forgotten, and I knew she hadn't, Mother. I asked her just now, and she said she hadn't. Hadn't what? questioned Mrs. Hartwell, looking a little apprehensively at her sister-in-law's white face and angry eyes. Hadn't forgotten that she was Uncle Bertram's wife? Kate, interposed Billy, steadily meeting her sister-in-law's gaze. Will you be good enough to tell me what this child is talking about? Mrs. Hartwell sighed and gave an impatient gesture. Kate, I've a mind to take you home on the next train, she said to her daughter. Run away now, downstairs. Your Aunt Billy and I want to talk. Come, come, hurry. I mean what I say, she added warningly, as she saw unmistakable signs of rebellion on the small young face. I wish, pouted little Kate, rising reluctantly and moving toward the door, that you didn't always send me away just when I wanted most to stay. Well, Kate, prompted Billy as the door closed behind the little girl. Yes, I suppose I'll have to say it now as long as that child has put her finger in the pie. But I hadn't intended to speak, no matter what I saw. I promised myself I wouldn't before I came. I know, of course, how Bertram and Cyril and William, too, say that I'm always interfering in affairs that don't concern me, though for that matter, if my own brother's affairs don't concern me, I don't know who should. But, as I said, I wasn't going to speak this time, no matter what I saw. And I haven't, except to William and Cyril and Aunt Hannah. But I suppose somewhere little Kate got hold of it. It's simply this, Billy. It seems to me high time you begin to realize that you're Bertram's wife as well as the baby's mother. That I am, I don't think I quite understand, said Billy unsteadily. No, I suppose you don't, sighed Kate. Though where your eyes are, I don't see, or rather I do see. You're on the baby always. It's all very well and lovely, Billy, to be a devoted mother. And you certainly are that, I'll say that much for you, and I'll admit I never thought you would be. But can't you see what you're doing to Bertram? Doing to Bertram by being a devoted mother to his son? Yes, doing to Bertram. Can't you see what a change there is in the boy? He doesn't act like himself at all. He's restless and gloomy and entirely out of sorts. Yes, I know, but that's his arm, pleaded Billy. Poor boy, he's so tired of it. Kate shook her head decisively. It's more than his arm, Billy. You'd see it yourself if you weren't blinded by your absorption in that baby. Where is Bertram every evening? Where is he daytimes? Do you realize that he's been at home scarcely one evening since I came? And as for the days, he's almost never here. But, Kate, he can't paint now, you know, so of course he doesn't need to stay so closely at home, defended Billy. He goes out to find distraction from himself. Yes, distraction, indeed, sniffed Kate. And where do you suppose he finds it? Do you know where he finds it? I tell you, Billy, Bertram Henshaw is not the sort of man that should find too much distraction outside his home. His tastes and his temperament are altogether too bohemian, and Billy interrupted with a peremptory upraised hand. Please remember, Kate, you are speaking of my husband to his wife, and his wife has perfect confidence in him, and is just a little particular as to what you say. Yes, well, I'm speaking of my brother, too, whom I know very well, shrugged Kate. All is, you may remember some time that I warn you, that's all. This trusting business is all very pretty, 
and I think twould be a lot prettier and a vast deal more sensible if you'd give him a little attention as well as trust, and see if you can't keep him at home a bit more. At least you'll know whom he's with, then. Cyril says he saw him last week with Bob Seaver. With Bob Seaver? faltered Billy, changing color. Yes, I see you remember him, smiled Kate, not quite agreeably. Perhaps now you'll take some stock in what I've said and remember it. I'll remember it, certainly, retorted Billy, a little proudly. You said a good many things to me in the past, Mrs. Hartwell, and I remember them all, every one. It was Kate's turn to flush, and she did it. Yes, I know, and I presume very likely sometimes there hasn't been much foundation for what I've said. I think this time, however, you'll find there is, she finished, with an air of hurt dignity. Billy made no reply, perhaps, because Delia at that moment brought in the baby. Mrs. Hartwell and little Kate left the strata the next morning. Until then, Billy contrived to keep, before them, a countenance serene and a manner free from unrest. Even when, after dinner that evening, Bertram put on his hat and coat and went out, Billy refused to meet her sister-in-law's meaning gaze. But in the morning, after they had left the house, Billy did not attempt to deceive herself. Determinedly, then, she set herself to going over in her mind the past months since the baby came, and she was appalled at what she found. Ever in her ears, too, was that feared name, Bob Seaver, and ever before her eyes was that night years ago, when, as an eighteen-year-old girl, she had followed Bertram and Bob Seaver into a glittering café at eleven o'clock at night, because Bertram had been drinking and was not himself. She remembered Bertram's face when he had seen her and what he had said when she begged him to come home. She remembered, too, what the family had said afterward, but she remembered also that years later Bertram had told her what that escapade of hers had really done for him and that he believed he had actually loved her from that moment. After that night, at all events, he had had little to do with Bob Seaver. And now Seaver was back again, it seemed, and with Bertram. They had been seen together, and if they had, what could she do? Surely she could hardly now follow them into a public café and demand that Seaver let her husband come home, but she could keep him at home, perhaps. Billy quite brightened at this thought. Kate had said that she was so absorbed in baby that her husband received no attention at all. Billy did not believe this was true, but if it were true, she could at least rectify that mistake. If it were attention that he wanted... He should want no more. Poor Bertram, no wonder that he had sought distraction outside, when one had a hard broken arm that would not let one do anything, what else could one do? Just here, Billy suddenly remembered the book A Talk to Young Wives. If she recollected rightly, there was a chapter that covered the very claim Kate had been making. Billy had not thought of the book for months, but she went at once to get it now. There might be, after all, something in it that would help her. THE COMING OF THE FIRST BABY. Billy found the chapter without difficulty and settled herself to read, her countenance alight with interest. In a surprisingly short time, however, a new expression came to her face, and at last a little gasp of dismay fell from her lips. She looked up then with a startled gaze. Had her walls possessed eyes and ears all these past months, only to give instructions to an unseen hand, that it might write what the eyes and ears had learned? For it was such sentences as these that the conscience-smitten Billy read. Maternity is apt to work a miracle in a woman's life, but sometimes it spells disaster so far as domestic bliss is concerned. The young mother, wrapped up in the delights and duties of motherhood, utterly forgets that she has a husband. She lives and moves and has her being in the nursery. She thinks baby, talks baby, knows only baby. She refuses to dress up because it is easier to take care of baby in a frowsy wrapper. She will not go out with her husband for fear something might happen to the baby. She gives up her music because baby won't let her practice. In vain her husband tries to interest her in his own affairs. She has neither eyes nor ears for him, only for baby. Now no man enjoys having his nose put out of joint even by his own child. He loves his child devotedly and is proud of him, of course, but that does not keep him from wanting the society of his wife occasionally, nor from longing for her old-time love and sympathetic interest. It is an admirable thing, certainly, 
for a woman to be a devoted mother, but maternal affection can be carried too far. Husbands have some rights as well as offspring, and the wife who neglects her husband for her babies does so at her peril. Home with the wife eternally in the nursery is apt to be a dull and lonely thing to the average husband, so he starts out to find amusement for himself, and he finds it. Then is the time when the new little life that is so precious and that should have bound the two more closely together becomes the wedge that drives them apart. Billy did not read any more. With a little sobbing cry she flung the book back into her desk and began to pull off her wrapper. Her fingers shook. Already she saw herself a monster, a wicked destroyer of domestic bliss, with her thoughtless absorption in baby, until he had become that awful thing, a wedge. And Bertram, poor Bertram, with his broken arm. She had not played to him, nor sung to him, nor gone out with him. And when had they had one of their good long talks about Bertram's work and plans? But it should all be changed now. She would play and sing and go out with him. She would dress up, too. He would see no more rappers. She would ask about his work and seem interested. She was interested. She remembered now that just before he was hurt he had told her of a new portrait and of a new face of a girl that he had planned to do. Lately he had said nothing about these. He had seemed discouraged, and no wonder with his broken arm. But she would change all that. He would see. And forthwith Billy hurried to her closet to pick out her prettiest house frock. Long before dinner Billy was ready waiting in the dining room. She had on a pretty little blue silk gown that she knew Bertram liked, and she watched very anxiously for Bertram to come up the steps. She remembered now with a pang that he had long since given up his peculiar ring, but she meant to meet him at the door just the same. Bertram, however, did not come. At a quarter before six he telephoned that he had met some friends and would dine at the club. "'My, my, how pretty we are!' exclaimed Uncle William when he came down to dinner together. "'New frock?' "'Why, no, Uncle William,' laughed Billy, a little tremulously. "'You've seen it dozens of times.' "'Have I?' murmured the man. "'I don't seem to remember it. "'Too bad Bertram isn't here to see you. "'Somehow you look unusually pretty tonight.' And Billy's heart ached anew. Billy spent the evening practicing, softly to be sure, so as not to wake Baby, but practicing. As the days passed, Billy discovered that it was much easier to say she would change things than it was really to change them. She changed herself, it is true, her clothes, her habits, her words, and her thoughts, but it was more difficult to change Bertram. In the first place, he was there so little. She was dismayed when she saw how very little indeed he was at home, and she did not like to ask him outright to stay. That was not in accordance with her plans. Besides, the talk to young wives said that indirect influence was much to be preferred always to direct persuasion, which last, indeed, usually failed to produce results. So Billy dressed up and practiced and talked of anything but the baby, and even hinted shamelessly once or twice that she would like to go to the theater, but all to little avail. True, Bertram brightened up for a minute when he came home and found her in a new or a favorite dress, and he told her how pretty she looked. He appeared to like to have her play to him, too, even declaring once or twice that it was quite like old times. Yes, it was. But he never noticed her hints about the theater, and he did not seem to like to talk about his work even a little. Billy laid this last fact to his injured arm. She decided that he had become blue and discouraged, and that he needed cheering up especially about his work. So she determinedly and systematically set herself to doing it. She talked of the fine work he had done, and of the still finer work he would yet do, when his arm was well. She told him how proud she was of him, and she let him see how dear his art was to her, and how badly she would feel if she thought he had really lost all his interest in his work and would never paint again. She questioned him about the new portrait he was to begin as soon as his arm would let him, and she tried to arouse his enthusiasm in the picture he had planned to show in the March exhibition of the Bohemian Ten telling him that she was sure his arm would allow him to complete at least one canvas to hang. In none of this, however, did Bertram appear to be the least interested. The one thing, indeed, which he seemed not to want to talk about, was his work, and he responded to her overtures on the subject with only moody silence or else with almost irritable monosyllables, all of which not only grieved but surprised Billy very much, 
for according to the talk to the young wives she was doing exactly what the ideal sympathetic interested in her husband's work wife should do when february came bringing with it no change for the better billy was thoroughly frightened bertram's arm plainly was not improving he was more gloomy and restless than ever he seemed not to want to stay at home at all and billy knew now for a certainty that he was spending more and more time with bob seaver and the boys poor billy nowhere could she look these days and see happiness even the adored baby seemed at times almost to give an added pang had he not become according to the talk to young wives that awful thing a wedge the annex too carried its sting for where was the need of an overflow house for happiness now when there was no happiness to overflow even the little jade idol on billy's mantle billy could not bear to see these days for its once bland smile had become a hideous grin demanding where now is your heap penny very good lucky but before bertram billy still carried a bravely smiling face and to him still she talked earnestly and enthusiastically of his work which last as it happened was the worst course she could have pursued for the one thing poor bertram wished to forget just now was his work end of chapter twenty seven chapter twenty eight of miss billy married this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil chenevere miss billy married by eleanor h porter chapter twenty eight conspirators early in february came arkwright's appearance at the boston opera house the first since he had sung there as a student a few years before he was an immediate and an unquestioned success his portrait adorned the first page of almost every boston newspaper the next morning and captious critics vied with each other to do him honor his full history from boyhood up was featured with special emphasis on his recent triumphs in new york and foreign capitals he was interviewed as to his opinion on everything from vegetarianism to woman suffrage and his preferences as to pies and pastimes were given headline prominence there was no doubt of it mr m j arkwright was a star all arkwright's old friends including billy bertram cyril marie calderwell alice gregory aunt hannah and tommy dunn went to hear him sing and after the performance he held a miniature reception with enough adulation to turn his head completely around he declared depreciatingly not until the next evening however did he have an opportunity for what he called a real talk with any of his friends then in caldwell's room he settled back in his chair with a sigh of content for a time his own and caldwell's affairs occupied their attention then after a short pause the tenor asked abruptly is there anything wrong with the henshaws caldwell caldwell came suddenly erect in his chair thank you i hoped you'd introduce that subject though for that matter if you hadn't i should yes there is and i'm looking to you old man to get them out of it i arkwright sat erect now yes what do you mean in a way the expected has happened though i know now that i didn't really expect it to happen in spite of my prophecies you may remember i was always skeptical on the subject of bertram settling down to a domestic hearthstone i insisted twould be the turn of a girl's head and the curve of her cheek that he wanted to paint arkwright looked up with a quick frown you don't mean that henshaw has been cat enough to find another caldwell threw up his hand no no not that we haven't that to deal with yet thank goodness there's no woman in it and really when you come right down to it if ever a fellow had an excuse to seek diversion bertram henshaw has poor chap it's just this bertram broke his arm again last october yes so i heard and i thought he was looking badly he is it's a bad business it was improperly set in the first place and it's not doing well now in fact i'm told on pretty good authority that the doctor says he probably will never use it again oh by george calderwell yes tough isn't it especially when you think of his work 
and know, as I happen to, that he's particularly dependent on his right hand for everything. He doesn't tell this generally, and I understand Billy and the family know nothing of it, how hopeless the case is. I mean, well, naturally the poor fellow has been pretty thoroughly discouraged, and to get away from himself he has gone back to his old bohemian habits spending much of his time with some of his old cronies that are none too good for him. Seaver, for instance. Bob Seaver? Yes, I know him. Arkwright's lips snapped together crisply. Yes, he said he knew you. That's why I'm counting on your help. What do you mean? I mean, I want you to get Henshaw away from him and keep him away. Arkwright's face darkened with an angry flush. Great Scott, Calderwell, what are you talking about? Henshaw is no kid to be toted home, and I'm no nursery governess to do the toting. Calderwell laughed quietly. No, I don't think anyone would take you for a nursery governess, Arkwright, in spite of the fact that you are still known to some of your friends as Mary Jane. But you can sing a song, man, which will promptly give you a thorough ticket to their innermost sacred circle. In fact, to my certain knowledge, Seaver is already planning a jamboree with you at the right hand of the Toastmaster. There's your chance. Once in, stay in, long enough to get Henshaw out." "'But, good heavens, Calderwell, it's impossible,' demanded Arkwright savagely. "'I can't walk up to the man, take him by the ear, and say, "'Hear you, sir, march home. Neither can I come the I am holier than thou act, and hold him up to the mirror of his transgressions. No, but you can get him out of it some way. You can find a way, for Billy's sake." There was no answer, and after a moment Calderwell went on more quietly. I haven't seen Billy but two or three times since I came back to Boston, but I don't need to. I know that she's breaking her heart over something, and of course that something is Bertram. There was still no answer. Arkwright got up suddenly and walked to the window. You see, I'm helpless, resumed Calderwell. I don't paint pictures, nor sing songs, nor write stories, nor dance jigs for a living, and you have to do one or another to be in with that set. And it's got to be a Johnny on the spot with Bertram. All is, something will have to be done to get him out of the state of mind and body he's in now, or Arkwright wheeled sharply. When did you say this jamboree was going to be? he demanded. Next week sometime. The date is not settled. They were going to consult you." Hmm, commented Arkwright, and though his next remark was a complete change of subject, Calderwell gave a contented sigh. If, when the proposition was first made to him, Arkwright was doubtful of his ability to be a successful Johnny on the spot, he was even more doubtful of it as the days passed, and he was attempting to carry out the suggestion. He had known that he was undertaking a most difficult and delicate task, and he soon began to fear that it was an impossible one as well. With a dogged persistence, however, he adhered to his purpose, ever on the alert to be more watchful, more tactful, more efficient in emergencies. Disagreeable as was the task in a way, in another way it was a great pleasure to him. He was glad of the opportunity to do anything for Billy. And then, too, he was glad of something absorbing enough to take his mind off his own affairs. He told himself, sometimes, that this helping another man to fight his tiger skin was assisting himself to fight his own. Arkwright was trying very hard not to think of Alice Gregory these days. He had come back hoping that he was in a measure cured of his folly, as he termed it, but the first look into Alice Gregory's blue-gray eyes had taught him the fallacy of that idea. In that very first meeting with Alice he feared that he had revealed his secret, for she was plainly so nervously distant and ill at ease with him that he could but construe her embarrassment and chilly dignity as pity for him and a desire to show him that she had nothing but friendship for him. Since then he had seen but little of her, partly because he did not wish to see her, and partly because his time was so fully occupied. Then, too, in a roundabout way, he had heard a rumor that Calderwell was engaged to be married, and though no feminine name had been mentioned in connection with the story, Arkwright had not hesitated to supply in his own mind that of Alice Gregory. 
beginning with the jamboree, which came off quite in accordance with Calderwell's prophecies. Arkwright spent the most of such time as was not given to his professional duties in deliberately cultivating the society of Bertram and his friends. To this extent he met with no difficulty, for he found that M. J. Arkwright, the new star in the operatic firmament, was obviously a welcome comrade. Beyond this it was not so easy. Arkwright wondered indeed sometimes if he were making any progress at all, but still he persevered. He walked with Bertram, he talked with Bertram, unobtrusively he contrived to be near Bertram almost always when they were together with the boys. Gradually he won from him the story of what the surgeon had said to him, and of how black the future looked in consequence. This established a new bond between them, so potent that Arkwright ventured to test it one day by telling Bertram the story of the tiger-skin the first tiger-skin in his uncle's library years ago, and of how, since then, any difficulty he had encountered he had tried to treat as a tiger-skin. In telling the story he was careful to draw no moral for his listener and to preach no sermon. He told the tale, too, with all possible whimsical lightness of touch, and immediately at its conclusion he changed the subject. But that he had not failed utterly in his design was evidence a few days later when Bertram grimly declared that he guessed his tiger-skin was a lively beast all right. The first time Arkwright went home with Bertram his presence was almost a necessity. Bertram was not quite himself that night. Billy admitted them. She had plainly been watching and waiting. Arkwright never forgot the look on her face as her eyes met his. There was a curious mixture of terror, hurt pride, relief, and shame overtopped by a fierce loyalty which almost seemed to say aloud the words, Don't you dare to blame him. Arkwright's heart ached with sympathy and admiration at the proudly courageous way in which Billy carried off the next few painful minutes, even when he bade her good-night a little later, only her eyes said thank you. Her lips were dumb. Arkwright often went home with Bertram after that. Not that it was always necessary, far from it. Some time, indeed, elapsed before he had quite the same excuse again for his presence, but he had found that occasionally he could get Bertram home earlier by adroit suggestions of one kind or another, and more frequently he was succeeding in getting him home for a game of chess. Bertram liked chess and was a fine player. Since breaking his arm he had turned to games with the feverish eagerness of one who looks for something absorbing to fill an unrestful mind. It was Seaver's skill in chess that had at first attracted Bertram to the man long ago, but Bertram could beat him easily, too easily for much pleasure in it now, so they did not play chess often these days. Bertram had found that, in spite of his injury, he could still take part in other games, and some of them, if not so intricate as chess, were at least more apt to take his mind off himself, especially if there were a bit of money up to add zest and interest. As it happened, however, Bertram learned one day that Arkwright could play chess and play well, too, as he discovered after their first game together. This fact contributed not a little to such success as Arkwright was having in his efforts to wean Bertram from his undesirable companions, for Bertram soon found out that Arkwright was more than a match for himself, and the occasional games he did succeed in winning only whetted his appetite for more. Many an evening now, therefore, was spent by the two men in Bertram's den, with Billy anxiously hovering near, her eyes lovingly watching either her husband's absorbed face or the pretty little red and white ivory figures which seemed to possess so wonderful a power to hold his attention. In spite of her joy at the chessman's efficacy in keeping Bertram at home, however, she was almost jealous of them. M Mr. Arkwright, couldn't you show me how to play some time? she said wistfully one evening when the momentary absence of Bertram had left the two alone together. I used to watch Bertram and Marie play years ago, but I never knew how to play myself. Not that I can see where the fun is in just sitting staring at a chessboard for half an hour at a time, though. But Bertram likes it. So I, I want to learn to stare with him. Will you teach me? I should be glad to, smiled Arkwright. Then will you come, maybe, sometimes when Bertram is at the doctor's? He goes every Tuesday and Friday at three o'clock for treatment. I'd rather you came then for two reasons. First, 
because I don't want Bertram to know I'm learning till I can play some, and secondly, because, because I don't want to take you away from him. The last words were spoken very low, and were accompanied by a painful blush. It was the first time Billy had ever hinted to Arkwright, in words, that she understood what he was trying to do. "'I'll come next Tuesday,' promised Arkwright, with a cheerfully unobservant air. Then Bertram came in, bringing the book of chess problems for which he had gone upstairs. End of chapter 28「Twenty Nine of Miss Billy Married. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Chenevere. Miss Billy Married by Eleanor H. Porter. Chapter Twenty Nine. Chess. Promptly at three o'clock Tuesday afternoon, Arkwright appeared at the Strata and for the next hour Billy did her best to learn the names and the moves of the pretty little ivory men. But at the end of the hour she was almost ready to give up in despair. If there weren't so many kinds, and if they didn't all insist on doing something different, it wouldn't be so bad, she sighed. But how can you be expected to remember which goes diagonal, and which crisscrosses, and which can't go but one square, and which can skip way across the board, especially when that little pawn thing can go straight ahead two squares sometimes, and the next minute only one, except when it takes things and then it goes crooked one square, and when that tiresome little horse tries to go all ways at once, and you can jump round and hurdle over anybody's head, even the king's, how can you expect folks to remember? But then Bertram remembers, she added resolutely, so I guess I can. Whenever possible after that, Arkwright came on Tuesdays and Fridays, and in spite of her doubts, Billy did very soon begin to remember. Spurred by her great desire to play with Bertram and surprise him, Billy spared no pains to learn well her lessons. Even among the baby's books and playthings these days might be found a manual of chess, for Billy pursued her study at all hours and some nights even her dreams were of ruined castles where kings and queens and bishops disported themselves with pawns for servants, and where a weird knight on horseback used the castle's highest tower for a hurdle, landing always a hundred yards to one side of where he would be expected to come down. It was not long, of course, before Billy could play a game of chess after a fashion, but she knew just enough to realize that she actually knew nothing and she knew, too, that until she could play a really good game, her moves would not hold Bertram's attention for one minute. Not at present, therefore, was she willing Bertram should know what she was attempting to do. Billy had not yet learned what the great surgeon had said to Bertram. She knew only that his arm was no better, and that he never voluntarily spoke of his painting. Over her now seemed to be hanging a vague horror. Something was the matter. She knew that but what it was she could not fathom. She realized that Arkwright was trying to help, and her gratitude, though silent, knew no bounds. Not even to Aunt Hannah or Uncle William could she speak of this thing that was troubling her, that they too understood in a measure she realized, but still she said no word. Billy was wearing a proud little air of aloofness these days that was heartbreaking to those who saw it and read it aright for what it was loyalty to Bertram no matter what happened. And so Billy pored over her chessboard feverishly, tirelessly, having ever before her longing eyes the dear time when Bertram, across the table from her, should sit happily staring for half an hour at a move she had made. Whatever Billy's chess-playing was to signify, however, in her own life, it was destined to play a part in the lives of two friends of hers that was most unexpected. During Billy's very first lesson, as it chanced, Alice Gregory called and found Billy and Arkwright so absorbed in their game that they did not at first hear Eliza speak her name. The quick color that flew to Arkwright's face at sight of herself was construed at once by Alice as embarrassment on his part at being found tete-a-tete -tete with Bertram Henshaw's wife, and she did not like it. She was not pleased that he was there. She was less pleased that he blushed for being there. It so happened that Alice found him there again several times. 
Alice gave a piano lesson at two o'clock every Tuesday and Friday afternoon to a little Beacon Street neighbor of Billy's, and she had fallen into the habit of stepping in to see Billy for a few minutes afterward, which brought her there at a little past three, just after the chess lesson was well started. If the first time that Alice Gregory found Arkwright opposite Billy at the chess table she was surprised and displeased, the second and third times she was much more so. When it finally came to her one day with sickening illumination that always the tete-a-tetes were during Bertram's hour at the doctor's, she was appalled. What could it mean? Had Arkwright given up his fight? Was he playing false to himself and to Bertram by trying thus on the sly to win the love of his friend's wife? Was this man, whom she had so admired for his brave stand, and to whom, all unasked, she had given her heart's best love, more the pity of it, was this idol of hers to show feet of clay after all? She could not believe it, and yet, sick at heart, but imbued with the determination of a righteous cause, Alice Gregory resolved, for Billy's sake, to watch and wait. If necessary, she should speak to someone, though to whom she did not know. Billy's happiness should not be put in jeopardy if she could help it. Indeed, no. As the weeks passed, Alice came to be more and more uneasy, distressed, and grieved. Of Billy she could believe no evil, but of Arkwright she was beginning to think she could believe everything that was dishonorable and despicable. And to believe that of the man she still loved, no wonder that Alice did not look nor act like herself these days. Incensed at herself because she did love him, angry at him because he seemed to be proving himself so unworthy of that love, and genuinely frightened at what she thought was the fast approaching wreck of all happiness for her dear friend Billy, Alice did not know which way to turn. At first she had told herself confidently that she would speak to somebody, but as time passed she saw the impracticability of that idea. Speak to somebody, indeed. To whom? When? Where? What should she say? Where was her right to say anything? She was not dealing with a parcel of naughty children who had pilfered the cake jar. She was dealing with grown men and women who presumably knew their own affairs and who certainly would resent any interference from her. On the other hand, could she stand calmly by and see Bertram lose his wife, Arkwright his honor, Billy her happiness, and herself her faith in human nature, all because to do otherwise would be to meddle in other people's business? Apparently she could, and should. At least that seemed to be the role which she was expected to play. It was when Alice had reached this unhappy frame of mind that Arkwright himself unexpectedly opened the door for her. The two were alone together in Bertram Henshaw's den. It was Tuesday afternoon Alice had called to find Billy and Arkwright deep in their usual game of chess. Then a matter of domestic affairs had taken Billy from the room. I'm afraid I'll have to be gone ten minutes or more, she had said, as she rose from the table reluctantly. But you might be showing Alice the moves, Mr. Arkwright, she had added with a laugh as she disappeared. Shall I teach you the moves? he had smiled when they were alone together. Alice's reply was so indignantly short and sharp that Arkwright, after a moment's pause, had said with a whimsical smile that yet carried a touch of sadness, I am forced to surmise from your answer that you think it is you who should be teaching me moves. At all events, I seem to have been making some moves lately that have not suited you, judging by your actions. Have I offended you in any way, Alice?" The girl turned with a quick lifting of her head. Alice knew that if ever she were to speak, it must be now. Never again could she hope for such an opportunity as this. Suddenly throwing circumspect caution quite aside, she determined that she would speak. Springing to her feet, she crossed the room and seated herself in Billy's chair at the chess table. Me, offend me, she exclaimed in a low voice, as if I were the one you were offending. Why, Alice, murmured the man in obvious stupefaction. Alice raised her hand, palm outward. Now don't, please don't pretend you don't know, she begged almost piteously. Please don't add that to all the rest. Oh, I understand. Of course, it's none of my affairs, and I wasn't going to speak, she choked. But 
today when you gave me this chance i had to at first i couldn't believe it she plunged on plainly hurrying against billy's return after all you told me of how you meant to fight it your tiger skin and i thought it merely happened that you were here alone with her those days i came then when i found out they were always the days mr henshaw was away at the doctor's i had to believe she stopped for breath arkwright who up to this moment had shown that he was completely mystified as to what she was talking about suddenly flushed a painful red he was obviously about to speak but she prevented him with a quick gesture there's more i've got to say please as if it weren't bad enough to do what you're doing at all but you must needs take it at such a time as this when her husband isn't doing just what he ought to do and we all know it it's so unfair to take her now to try to to win and you aren't even fair with him she protested tremulously you pretend to be his friend you go with him everywhere it's just as if you were helping to to pull him down you're one with the whole bunch the blood suddenly receded from arkwright's face leaving it very white but if alice saw it she paid no heed everybody says you are then to come here like this on the sly when you know he can't be here i oh can't you see what you're doing there was a moment's pause then arkwright spoke a deep pain looked from his eyes he was still very pale and his mouth had settled into sad lines i think perhaps it may be just as well if i tell you what i am doing or rather trying to do he said quietly then he told her and so you see he added when he had finished the tale i haven't really accomplished much after all and it seems the little i have accomplished has led only to my being misjudged by you my best friend alice gave a sobbing cry her face was scarlet horror shame and relief struggled for mastery in her countenance oh but i didn't know i didn't know she moaned twisting her hands nervously and now when you've been so brave so true for me to accuse you of oh can you ever forgive me but knowing that you did care for her it did look she choked into silence and turned away her head he glanced at her tenderly mournfully yes he said after a minute in a low voice i can see how it did look and so i'm going to tell you now something i had meant never to tell you there really couldn't have been anything in that you see for i found out long ago that it was gone whatever love there had been for billy but your tiger skin oh yes i thought it was alive smiled arkwright sadly when i asked you to help me fight it but one day very suddenly i discovered that it was nothing but a dead skin of dreams and memories but i made another discovery too i found that just beyond lay another one and that was very much alive another one alice turned to him in wonder but you never asked me to help you fight that one he shook his head no i couldn't you see you couldn't have helped me you'd only have hindered me hindered you yes you see it was my love for you that i was fighting then alice gave a low cry and flushed vividly but arkwright hurried on his eyes turned away oh i understand i know i'm not asking for anything i heard some time ago of your engagement to calderwell i've tried many times to say the proper expected pretty speeches but i couldn't i will now though i do you have all my tenderest best wishes for your happiness dear if long ago i hadn't been such a blind fool as not to know my own heart but but there's some mistake interposed alice palpitatingly with hanging head i'm i'm not engaged to mr calderwell arkwright turned and sent a keen glance into her face you're not no but i heard that calderwell he stopped helplessly you heard that mr calderwell was engaged very likely but it so happens he isn't engaged to me murmured alice faintly but long ago you said arkwright paused his eyes still keenly searching her face never mind what i said long ago laughed alice trying unsuccessfully to meet his gaze one says lots of things at times you know into arkwright's eyes came a new light a light that plainly needed but a breath to fan it into quick fire alice he said softly 
Do you mean that maybe now I needn't try to fight that other tiger skin? There was no answer. Arkwright reached out a pleading hand. Alice, dear, I've loved you so long, he begged unsteadily. Don't you think that sometime, if I was very, very patient, you could just begin to care a little for me? Still, there was no answer. Then, slowly, Alice shook her head. Her face was turned quite away, which was a pity, for if Arkwright could have seen the sudden tender mischief in her eyes, his own would not have become so sober. Not even a little bit? I couldn't ever begin, answered a half-smothered voice. Alice, cried the man, heartbrokenly. Alice turned now, and for a fleeting instant let him see her eyes, glowing with the love so long kept in relentless exile. I couldn't, because, you see, I began long ago, she whispered. Alice! It was the same single word, but spoken with a world of difference, for into it now was crowded all the glory and the wonder of a great love. Alice! breathed the man again, and this time the word was oh so tenderly whispered into the little pink and white ear of the girl in his arms i got delayed began billy in the doorway oh she broke off beating a hushed but precipitate retreat fully thirty minutes later billy came to the door again this time her approach was heralded by a snatch of song i hope you'll excuse my being gone so long she smiled as she entered the room where her two guests sat decorously face to face at the chess table. Well, you know you said you'd be gone ten minutes, Arkwright reminded her politely. Yes, I know I did. And Billy, to her credit, did not even smile at the man who did not know ten minutes from fifty. End of chapter 29、Chapter、Thirty of Miss Billy Married This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil c h e n e v e r Miss Billy Married by Eleanor H. Porter. Chapter 30 By a Baby's Hand. After all, it was the baby's hand that did it, as was proper, and perhaps to be expected. For surely was it not Bertram Jr.'s place? To show his parents that he was indeed no wedge, but a dear and precious tie, binding two loving, loyal hearts more and more closely together? It would seem indeed that Bertram Jr. thought so, perhaps, and very bravely he set about it. Though to carry out his purpose, he had to turn his steps into an unfamiliar way, a way of pain and weariness and danger. It was Arkwright who told Bertram that the baby was very sick. And that Billy wanted him. Bertram went home at once to find a distracted, white faced Billy, and a twisted, pain racked little creature who it was almost impossible to believe was the happy, laughing baby boy he had left that morning. For the next two weeks, nothing was thought of in the silent old Beacon Street house but the tiny little life hovering so near death's door that twice it appeared to have slipped quite across the threshold. All through those terrible weeks, it seemed as if Billy neither ate nor slept, and always at her side, comforting, cheering, and helping whenever possible, was Bertram, tender, loving, and marvelously thoughtful. Then came the turning point when the universe itself appeared to hang upon a baby's breath. Gradually, almost imperceptibly, came the fluttering back of the tiny spirit. Into the longing arms stretched so far, far out to meet it and hold it. And the father and the mother, looking into each other's sleepless, dark ringed eyes, knew that their son was once more theirs to love and cherish. When two have gone together with a dear one down into the valley of the shadow of death, and have come back either mourning or rejoicing, they find a different world from the one they had left. Things that were great before seem small, and some things that were small seem great. At least Bertram and Billy found their world thus changed when together they came back, bringing their son with them. In the long weeks of convalescence, when the healthy rosiness stole bit by bit into the baby's waxen face, 
and the light of recognition and understanding crept day by day into the baby's eyes. There was many a quiet hour for heart-to-heart -heart talks between the two who so anxiously and joyously hailed every rosy tint and fleeting sparkle. And there was so much to tell, so much to hear, so much to talk about. And always running through everything was that golden thread of joy, besides which all else paled, that they had baby and each other, as if anything else mattered. To be sure there was Bertram's arm. Very early in their talks Billy found out about that. But Billy, with baby getting well, was not to be daunted even by this. Nonsense, darling, not paint again indeed. Why, Bertram, of course you will, she cried confidently. But Billy, the doctor said, began Bertram, but Billy would not even listen. Very well, what if he did, dear, she interrupted. What if he did say you couldn't use your right arm much again? Billy's voice broke a little, then quickly steadied into something very much like triumph. You've got your left one. Bertram shook his head. I can't paint with that. Yes, you can, insisted Billy firmly. Why, Bertram, what do you suppose you were given two arms for, if not to fight with both of them? And I'm going to be ever so much prouder of what you paint now, because I'll know how splendidly you work to do it. Besides, there's Baby. As if you weren't ever going to paint for Baby. Why, Bertram, I'm going to have you paint Baby one of these days. Think how pleased he'll be to see it when he grows up. He's nicer anyhow than any old face of a girl you ever did. Paint? Why, Bertram, darling, of course you're going to paint and better than you ever did before. Bertram shook his head again, but this time he smiled, and patted Billy's cheek with the tip of his forefinger. As if I could, he disclaimed. But that afternoon he went into his long deserted studio and hunted up his last unfinished picture. For some time he stood motionless before it. Then with a quick gesture of determination he got out his palette paints and brushes, this time not until he had painted ten, a dozen, a score of strokes, did he drop his brush with a sigh and carefully erase the fresh paint on the canvas. The next day he worked longer, and this time he allowed a little, a very little, of what he had done to remain. The third day Billy herself found him at his easel. I wonder, do you suppose I could? he asked fearfully. Why, dearest, of course you can. Haven't you noticed? Can't you see how much more you can do with your left hand now? You've had to use it, you see, and I've seen you do a lot of things with it lately that you never used to do at all. And, of course, the more you do with it, the more you can. I know, but that doesn't mean that I can paint with it, sighed Bertram, ruefully eyeing the tiny bit of fresh color his canvas showed for his long afternoon's work. You wait and see, nodded Billy, with so overwhelming a cheery confidence that Bertram, looking into her glowing face, was conscious of a curious throb of exultation, almost as if already the victory were his. But it was not always of Bertram's broken arm nor even of his work that they talked, Bertram hanging over the baby's crib to assure himself that the rosiness and the sparkle were really growing more apparent every day, used to wonder sometimes how ever in the world he could have been jealous of his son. He said as much one day to Billy. To Billy it was a most astounding idea. You mean you were actually jealous of your own baby? she gasped. Why, Bertram, how could— And was that why you— you sought distraction and— Oh, but Bertram, that was all my f fault she quavered remorsefully. I wouldn't play nor sing nor go to walk, nor anything, and I wore horrid frowsy wrappers all the time, and— Oh, come, come, Billy, expostulated the man. I'm not going to have you talk like that about my wife. But I did. The book said I did, wailed Billy. The book? Good heavens, are there books in this, too? demanded Bertram. Yes, the same one. The—the the talks to young wives, nodded Billy. 
and then, because some things had grown small to them, and some others great, they both laughed happily. But even this was not quite all, for one evening, very shyly, Billy brought out the chessboard. "'Of course I can't play well,' she faltered, "'and maybe you don't want to play with me at all.' But Bertram, when he found out why she had learned, was very sure he did want very much to play with her. Billy did not beat, of course. She did several times experience for a few blissful minutes the pleasure of seeing Bertram sit motionless, studying the board because of a move she had made, and though in the end her king was ignominiously trapped with not an unguarded square upon which to set his poor distracted foot, the memory of those blissful minutes when she had made Bertram stare more than paid for the final checkmate. By the middle of June the baby was well enough to be taken to the beach, and Bertram was so fortunate as to secure the same house they had occupied before. Once again William went down in Maine for his fishing trip, and the strata was closed. In the beach house Bertram was painting industriously with his left hand. Almost he was beginning to feel Billy's enthusiasm. Almost he was believing that he was doing good work. It was not the face of a girl now. It was the face of a baby, smiling, laughing, even crying sometimes, at other times just gazing straight into your eyes with adorable soberness. Bertram still went into Boston twice a week for treatment, though the treatment itself had changed. The great surgeon had sent him to still another specialist. "'There's a chance, though perhaps a small one,' he had said. "'I'd like you to try it anyway.' As the summer advanced, Bertram thought sometimes that he could see a slight improvement in his injured arm, but he tried not to think too much about this. He had thought the same thing before, only to be disappointed in the end. Besides, he was undeniably interested just now in seeing if he could paint with his left hand. Billy was sure, and she had said that she would be prouder than ever of him if he could, and he would like to make Billy proud. Then, too, there was the baby. He had no idea a baby could be so interesting to paint. He was not sure but that he was going to like to paint babies even better than he had liked to paint his face of a girl that had brought him his first fame. In September the family returned to the strata. The move was made a little earlier this year on account of Alice Gregory's wedding. Alice was to be married in the pretty living room at the Annex, just where Billy herself had been married a few short years before. And Billy had made great plans for the wedding not all of which she was able to carry out, for Alice, like Marie before her, had very strong objections to being placed under too great obligations. "'And you see, really, anyway,' she told Billy, "'I owe the whole thing to you to begin with, even my husband.' "'Nonsense! Of course you don't,' disputed Billy. "'But I do. If it hadn't been for you, I should never have found him again.' And, of course, I shouldn't have had this dear little home to be married in. And I never could have left Mother if she hadn't had Aunt Hannah and the Annex, which means you. And if I hadn't found Mr. Arkwright, I might never have known how, how I could go back to my old home, as I am going on my honeymoon trip, and just know that every one of my old friends who shakes hands with me isn't pitying me now because I'm my father's daughter. And that means you. For, you see, I never would have known that my father's name was cleared if it hadn't been for you. And, oh, Alice, please, please, begged Billy, laughingly raising two protesting hands. Why don't you say that it's to me you owe just breathing and be done with it? Well, I will then, avowed Alice doggedly, and it's true, too. For honestly, my dear, I don't believe I would have been breathing today, nor mother either, if you hadn't found us that morning and taken us out of those awful rooms. I? Never. You wouldn't let me take you out, laughed Billy. You proud little thing. Maybe you've forgotten how you turned poor Uncle William and me out into the cold, cold world that morning, just because we dared to aspire to your Lowestoft teapot. But I haven't. Oh, Billy, please don't, begged Alice, the painful color staining her face. 
if you knew how I've hated myself since for the way I acted that day, and really you did take us away from there, you know. No, I didn't. I merely found two good tenants for Mr. and Mrs. Delano, corrected Billy with a sober face. Oh, yes, I know all about that, smiled Alice affectionately. And you got Mother and me here to keep Aunt Hannah company and teach Tommy Dunn. And you got Aunt Hannah here to keep us company and take care of Tommy Dunn. And you got Tommy Dunn here so Aunt Hannah and we could have somebody to teach and take care of. And as for the others, but Billy put her hands to her ears and fled. The wedding was to be on the 15th. From the West, Kate wrote that, of course, it was none of her affairs, particularly as neither of the interested parties was a relation, but still she should think that for a man in Mr. Arkwright's position nothing but a church wedding would do at all, as, of course, he did in a way belong to the public. Alice, however, declared that perhaps he did belong to the public when he was Don somebody or other in doublet and hose, but when he was just plain Michael Jeremiah Arkwright in a frock coat, he was hers, and she did not propose to make a grand opera show of her wedding. And as Arkwright, too, very much disapproved of the church wedding idea, the two were married in the annex living room at noon on the 15th as originally planned, in spite of Mrs. Kate Hartwell's letter. It was soon after the wedding that Bertram told Billy he wished she would sit for him with Bertram, Jr. "'I want to try my hand at you both together,' he coaxed. "'Why, of course, if you like, dear,' agreed Billy promptly. "'Though I think Baby is just as nice, and even nicer alone.' Once again, all over Bertram's studio began to appear sketches of Billy, this time a glorified, tender Billy, with the wonderful mother love in her eyes. Then, after several sketches of trial poses, Bertram began his picture of Billy and the baby together. Even now Bertram was not sure of his work. He knew that he could not yet paint with his old freedom and ease. He knew that his stroke was not so sure, so untrammeled. But he knew, too, that he had gained wonderfully during the summer, and that he was gaining now every day. To Billy he said nothing of all this. Even to himself he scarcely put his hope into words. But in his heart he knew that what he was really painting his mother and child picture for was the Bohemian Tin Club Exhibition in March, if he could but put upon canvas the vision that was spurring him on. And so Bertram worked all through those short winter days, not always upon the one picture, of course, but upon some picture or sketch that would help to give his still uncertain left hand the skill that had belonged to its mate. And always cheering, encouraging, insisting on victory was Billy, so that even had Bertram been tempted sometimes to give up, he could not have done so and faced Billy's aggrieved, disappointed eyes. And when at last his work was completed, and the pictured mother and child in all their marvelous life and beauty seemed ready to step from the canvas, Billy drew a long, ecstatic breath. Oh. Bertram, it is, it is the best work you have ever done. Billy was looking at the baby, always she had ignored herself as part of the picture. And won't it be fine for the exhibition? Bertram's hand tightened on the chair back in front of him. For a moment he could not speak. Then, a bit huskily, he asked, Would you dare risk it? Risk it? Why, Bertram Henshaw! I've meant that picture for the exhibition from the very first, only I never dreamed you could get it so perfectly lovely. Now what do you say about Baby being nicer than any old face of a girl that you ever did?" she triumphed. And Bertram, who even to himself had not dared whisper the word exhibition, gave a tremulous laugh that was almost a sob. So overwhelming was his sudden realization of what faith and confidence had meant to Billy, his wife. If there was still a lingering doubt in Bertram's mind, it must have been dispelled in less than an hour after the Bohemian Ten Club exhibition flung open its doors on its opening night. Once again Bertram found his pictures the cynosure of all admiring eyes, and himself the center of an enthusiastic group of friends and fellow artists who vied with each other in hearty words of congratulation. 
and when later the feared critics whose names and opinions counted for so much in his world had their say in the daily press and weekly reviews bertram knew how surely indeed he had won and when he read that henshaw's work shows how a peculiar strength a sort of reserve power as it were which beautiful as was his former work it never showed before he smiled grimly and said to billy i suppose now that was the fighting i did with my good left hand eh dear but there was yet one more drop that was to make bertram's cup of joy brim to overflowing it came just one month after the exhibition in the shape of a terse dozen words from the doctor bertram fairly flew home that day he had no consciousness of any means of locomotion he thought he was going to tell his wife at once his great good news but when he saw her speech suddenly fled and all that he could do was to draw her closely to him with his left arm and hide his face why bertram dearest what what is it stammered the thoroughly frightened billy has anything happened no no yes yes everything has happened i mean it's going to happen choked the man billy that old chap says that i'm going to have my arm again think of it my good right arm that i've lost so long oh bertram breathed billy and she too fell to sobbing later when speech was more coherent she faltered well anyway it doesn't make any difference how many beautiful pictures you p paint after this bertram i can't be prouder of any than i am of the one your left hand did oh but i have you to thank for all that dear no you haven't disputed billy blinking teary eyes but she paused then went on spiritedly but anyhow i i don't believe any one not even kate can say now that that i've been a hindrance to you in your career hindrance scoffed bertram in a tone that left no room for doubt and with a kiss that left even less if possible billy for still another minute was silent then with a wistfulness that was half playful half serious she sighed bertram i believe being married is something like clocks you know especially at the first clocks dear yes i was out to aunt hannah's today she was fussing with her clock the one that strikes half an hour ahead and i saw all those quantities of wheels little and big that have to go just so with all the little cogs fitting into all the other little cogs just exactly right well that's like marriage see there's such a lot of little cogs in everyday life that have to be fitted so they'll run smoothly that have to be adjusted especially at the first oh billy what an idea but it's so really bertram anyhow i know my cogs were always getting out of place at the first laughed billy and i was like aunt hannah's clock too always going off half an hour ahead of time and maybe i shall be so again sometimes but bertram her voice shook a little if you'll just look at my face you'll see that i tell the right time there just as aunt hannah's clock does i'm sure always i'll tell the right time there even if i do go off half an hour ahead as if i didn't know that answered bertram very low and tenderly besides i reckon i have some cogs of my own that need adjusting end of chapter thirty end of miss billy married by eleanor h porter